Hello, my name is Jackson Gregory. I'm going to tell you an introduction to game theory through sequential games. So first, the background. What is a game? Well, here's our definition. A game refers to a set of situations in which agents make decisions. There are a defined set of allowable decisions, and decisions are made by some number of agents in each situation. For example, the game of tic-tac-toe is a game. There are two agents. Each in sequence makes a decision as to the location of the next piece, and there are a clearly defined set of allowable decision options based on the board state in each situation. Now, a play is one instance of a particular game. For example, what colloquially we call a game or maybe a match of chess would be one play of chess, where chess is the actual mathematical game. The participants of a game, or the agents, are called players. All games have one or more players, because if it did not have any players, there would be no decisions to make, no one to make the decisions, so it would not be a game. A situation or a state of the game is referred to as a position. This is the a moment where a decision is made, for example, the starting position of tic-tac-toe is an empty board with the starting player making a decision. And after that first player makes a decision, the new position is a board with one piece on it placed according to the first player, and the, now the second player has to make a decision. At each position, each at least one player has to make a decision, sometimes more than one depending on the game. And the decision made is called a move or an action. For example, in tic-tac-toe, placing a piece would be a move or an action. And in chess, moving a piece would be a move, which you know, is very intuitive. Now, a strategy is a plan which tells the player what move to choose in every possible position. And one goal of game theory is to create optimized strategies for games. And now, of course, like tic-tac-toe is a solved game, so there's a winning strategy in each position, or at least a drawing strategy. Whereas some more complex games like Go, there is no solved strategy, so we're looking for the best strategy to try to win in that game. Now, a player's payoff is the value that a player receives from the outcome of a play. play payoff can also be considered for positions, consider it as the expected final payoff for the player based on the position, or for moves as the payoff for the resulting position. And in tic-tac-toe, player receive a positive payoff if they win, or a negative payoff if they lose, usually represented as just one and minus one. In poker, you would probably represent a player's payoff based on the profit they make, so how many chips they end with minus how many chips they started with. In a blind auction, or even a regular auction, a player's payoff would be measured based on their judgment of the value of the item they received relative to the price they paid for it. Now, if they were just going to sell this item, their valuation might just simply be the selling price, but if it were, for example, an art auction and they were going to keep the art piece they won, then their payoff would be determined on how highly they value the piece they won versus the amount of money they had to spend, spend to acquire it. Now, we also usually assume that all players have rational behavior. Rational behavior means that they're acting to try to get the best payoff for themselves and not just picking decisions that will hurt their payoff. We assume everyone wants to win, or in this case, to get the highest payoff. Now, a simultaneous game is a game where each player only gets to move once, and all players make their move at the same time. A single bid blind auction would be an example of a simultaneous game. Everyone places one bid all at the same time, or if it's not at the same time, you could simply model it as at the same time, because the time the bid is placed does not matter, as they all only place one bid. A sequential game is a game where only one player moves at a time, but players may move multiple times. Chess is an example of a sequential game. Some games can be neither simultaneous nor sequential, but no games will be both. Now, a sequential game can have perfect information, which means that every player knows all previous moves when they are about to make their move. Most traditional games like chess are examples of games with perfect information. Complete 
information it means all players know all information about the game, the orders players move, all possible moves in all positions, and the payoffs for all outcomes. Chess has complete information while poker does not. And uh, the reason that poker does not, because even though players do know at the end of a hand who will win, uh, in the middle of the hand you don't know necessarily if you, like for example, raise versus call versus fold, you will not know at the time what the outcome will be until the cards are all turned over onto the table. Now, for any given game state, the best response of a player is the move that yields the highest payoff for that player given all previous and simultaneous moves. For example, in tic-tac-toe, if one player sets up two pieces in a row, the other player's best move is typically to block it to prevent that first player from winning with three in a row on their next turn, unless a different move would cause the second player to win instead, in which case it doesn't matter that the first player would have a winning move on their next turn because they won't get to make their next turn. Now, let's say that M1 and M2 are two possible moves for a player. Then M1 is said to strictly dominate M2 if M1 always results in a higher payoff than M2 for the player. For example, in chess, a move checkmating the other player strictly dominates a move that would instead put the current player into checkmate. You would certainly rather win the game than lose the game. Now, in 1994, the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences was shared by a team of mathematicians, John Forbes Nash, Reinhard Selton, and John Harziani. The award was for their pioneering analysis of equilibria and the theory of non-cooperative games. Nash earned a PhD in 1950 with a dissertation in non-cooperative games, and he defined what came to be known as the Nash Equilibrium. Now, a pure Nash Equilibrium is an outcome or combination of moves such that each move involved is the best response to the other moves. In other words, it is a state where no single player can obtain a more preferable outcome by changing their move if all other players' moves remain the same. Now, let's talk about the Prisoner's Dilemma. Prisoner's Dilemma is where two, two criminals get caught. They can either talk to the cops about what happened or keep quiet. They do not know what the other will do before they make their decision. If one talks, the other will receive a harsher punishment. If they both talk, they'll both receive harsher punishment than they would if neither of them talk. So here are the payoffs, where you would get a negative payoff for more years in prison. And so you'll see it does have a Nash equilibrium if both players talk, neither of them can get a better reward solely by changing their own decision. It would be preferable for both players for them to both be quiet, but either one of them could get a better payoff by switching their own decision if the other player stays constant. So a Nash equilibrium occurs when they both talk, not when they are both quiet. Now, given Nash equilibria N1 and N2, we say that N1 is Pareto dominated by N2 if every player's payoff in N1 is less than or equal to their payoff in N2. For example, in the last example, if we did have an Ash equilibrium in the top left, it would Pareto dominate the bottom right. But since there's no Nash equilibrium there, it cannot be Pareto dominate. A Nash equilibrium is said to be Pareto optimal if any Nash equilibrium that Pareto dominates it has equivalent payoffs for all players. Because Pareto domination means all of them are less than or equal, so in the case that they are all equal, none are less than, then, they are, then an outcome is Pareto optimal because there is no other Nash equilibrium that Pareto dominates it. That is not equal. In ex for example, in this payoff matrix, which is just theoretical, the highlighted squares are all Nash equilibria. Neither player could get a better payoff solely by changing their own option without also changing the other player's option. But the square highlighted in yellow is Pareto dominated by the squares in green because both players have better payoffs in the squares in green. Since <coughs> the squares in green are Pareto dominated by each other, but both players have equal payoffs in both of them, they are both Pareto optimal because the only things of dominating them have equal payoffs. Now let's talk about the game digraph and the game tree. A directed graph or tree representation of a game will represent positions in the game as nodes and moves in the game as directed edges between the nodes. When a game's directed graph is labeled with the decision's payoffs, it's called the game digraph. When a game's tree is labeled with the decision's payoffs, it's called the game tree. 
The representation as a game diagram or a game tree can also be called the extensive form of the sequential game. And let's talk about the game NIM before we get into these examples. Game NIM is a sequential mathematical game with perfect and complete information. NIM is played with two players and a number of stones, which is determined before the game begins. There must be at least two stones, but the number of stones can be arbitrarily large. The players alternate making moves until all stones are gone. On a player's turn, they can remove either one or two stones from the set of stones. Once the player removes the final stone from the set, that player wins. Or Alternatively, when a player is trying to remove stones but there are none to remove, that player loses. It's an equivalent representation. If you consider the payoffs to be one for winning and negative one for losing, it makes NIM a zero-sum game. So, with that in mind, here is an example game tree for NIM with six stones. So you'll see on the left, white as six for white, calling these players white and black. The first player has six stones to choose from. They can choose to pick either one or two stones. Their decision will send to either the top or the bottom tree, where at each point black can choose to remove either one or two stones. And this will continue on branching off until you reach the zero point where there are no stones left and you'll see which player was about to move who will not get to play and will lose and the payoffs are listed off to the right side. Similarly, here is the game digraph, which is represented uh, in this case much more compactly, but has the same outcome. And now we talk about backward induction, which is a process that performs induction from the end of the game working backward. Looking at the payouts of this final set of nodes, the decisions to be made on the final turn can be determined best on, based on the best payoffs for whatever player is making the move. So then from those payoffs of the last set of decisions, the payoffs expected from the second to last set of decisions can be determined. In the same manner, the inductive process can be followed back to the start of the game, which will determine the expected payoffs for the game. So for example, let's look at backward induction on NIM with six stones that we were just talking about. So you'll see at the zero point, you will know who won the game based on who took the last stones. For and if you, for example, had one stone remaining, that player with one stone remaining can simply take the last stone and win the game. So they expect to win the game if they have only one stone left. Same at two stones. If there were two stones, the player could choose to either take one stone, making the other player win, or to take both stones, winning the game. So of course the player will choose to win rather than to lose. So the expected payout for the player who starts their turn with two stones left is also one, which is a win. However, if a player starts their turn with three stones still left, whichever option they take will cause the other player to get a win scenario. So regardless of what they pick, they expect to lose. So they expect to pay out is negative one for the player who's playing and one for the player who is not. Again, moving up to four, since, if, since starting your turn with three is a loss, the player who starts their turn with four can force the other player to start their turn with three. So that gives the optimal payout, which means they should go to three, which gives a payoff of one for the player who's playing and negative one for the player who's not. This procedure is then followed for five, which can only, five can only be accessed by black in this case. So black will choose to take two and force white into a losing scenario, which gives a payoff of one for black and negative one for white, which means that for white, starting the game with six, the only two options are positions where black can force white to have three, which forces white to give black a winning scenario, which means the payout for the game is expected to be negative one for the first player, termed white in this example, or and one for the second player, termed black in this example. In this way, we know what rational players will do, and it will result in the second player winning every time in six stone nim. Now, going to talk about Zermelo's theorem, coined by Ernst Zermelo in 1913. He said that every finite perfect information sequential game without random moves, which are moves that involve randomness, can be analyzed using backward induction. The payoff values of the start position are what the player should expect when playing the game, provided they all play rationally. And this theorem was proved by him in his 1913 publication on an application of set theory to the theory of the game of chess. Now, this theory is basically the basis of backward induction. It says it works in all cases for these games that meet those criteria. And now, a corollary to this is if you assume all players are playing rationally and a backward induction strategy is known, 
then if a player deviates from their backward induction strategy, their payoff will not increase, which is important because it means that the backward induction strategy is optimal. So now let's prove it. We'll do a proof by contradiction. We'll assume there's some position P where deviation from the backward induction strategy by choosing move M1 rather than the strategy you suggested move M2 results in an increased final payoff. So then the final payoff for the player if M1 is chosen is higher, higher than the final payoff if M2 is chosen, which means that when backward induction was performed, since the final payoff for the player if M1 is chosen is higher than if M2 is chosen, the backward induction strategy would choose move M1 over move M2, which means that M1 is part of the backward induction strategy, which is a contradiction from our assumption that it deviates from the strategy. So there cannot be a position P where deviating from the backward induction strategy increases a player's payoff, which is you know very important because it means backward induction works, which is fantastic because it's a very powerful tool. So now we'll talk about what a greedy strategy is. So a greedy strategy is a strategy which decides what to do in a position by choosing the move whose successor positions have the highest expected value. Importantly, it's just the successor positions that have the highest expected value, not the value at the end of the game. And specifically, a K greedy strategy looks K moves ahead and chooses the maxi min or backward induction choice K moves ahead. Maxi min uh, is similar to backward induction, where it assumes that all players will choose the maximum for themselves and the minimum for all other players when they are playing. And now the big downside of greedy strategies and the reason that greedy strategies aren't used all the time over something like backward induction is that they are not guaranteed to find the optimal moves because what looks like it could be the best move just by looking at the expected value in the next couple turns may not turn out to be the best move long term. For example, in chess, sometimes it's better to sacrifice a couple pieces for long term positioning that will end up winning you the game. But if you just looked in the short term and all you saw was that your pieces are gone now, you might think, well, that's not as good of a move. But in the long run, it ends up being better, and a greedy strategy would not always find that. However, the major benefit of greedy strategies is that they can be much faster than non-greedy strategies. And the reason for this is fairly simple. It's because looking at a data set of only a few moves into the future is much faster than having to look at all possible moves for the remainder of the game until the end. So <clears throat> based on these downsides and this benefit, why would you use it? Well, greedy strategies are typically used when the data set is very large. For example, if you have an AI for a game like Go, the very complex game, you would probably use a greedy strategy at least to some degree because the set of possible moves is too large to compute within a short period of time if you're looking at all possible moves for the remainder of the game. <clears throat> That's why when recently the AlphaGo AI was uh, beating the top human players, they used some greedy strategies to at least weed out some of the worst moves. And then as they advanced from there, they had more processing time to explore what they thought were good moves to see which ones were truly the best because they didn't have to waste their time on the worst moves. So in this way, using greedy strategies in combination with other methods can have a huge impact. Now, decision theory. In order for a one player game to qualify as a game, it must contain randomness. Otherwise the outcome would be fixed from the start. And so decision theory is the special case of game theory for games with one player. Examples of one player games are often related to gambling, something like blackjack or sports wagers, because those are you know, obvious cases where there is probability in only one player, but can also appear in things like determining whether or not to purchase insurance on a package. And that's of course important for economic applications. Decision theory does use many traditional game theory tools, namely the ones that don't require additional players. And backward induction in particular is a powerful tool for decision theory when it's applicable. 
And so, talking more about applications, economics is a huge application of game theory. Many things in economics can be modeled as games under this, these definitions. And so, I'm going to tell you that there were several Nobel Prizes in economics awarded to teams who worked in game theory. 1994, of course, was Nash for his pioneering analysis of equilibria and the theory of non-cooperative games, which is where the Nash Equilibrium was named. 1996, team won it for incentives under asymmetric incomplete information and what that was uh, blind auctions were the focus of that 2001 a team won it for their work on markets which are games with asymmetric or as we would call it incomplete information in 2005 a team won it for having enhanced our understanding of conflict and cooperation through game theory analysis it calls out game theory by name and conflict and cooperation are for players working together or apart, which are things we can model with game theory. In 2007, a team won it for having laid the foundations of mechanism design theory, which is a field of game theory designed around designing the games themselves such that players are forced to make rational decisions. In 2012, most recently, a team won for the theory of stable allocations and the practice of market design. And what this has to do with game theory is that the allocations bit is for allocating people, like students, for example, to institutions like, say, colleges, based on their preferences. So the payoffs are based on finding the preferences that fit institutions want their stu that like the students they get, students that like the universities they get. So that sort of thing is modeled as a game. Now, other fields. Game theory models are also especially applicable to fields like politics. Campaigning, voting, policy decisions, etc. can all be modeled as games. Artificial intelligence. It's basically just computers doing game theory. You want to model their tasks as games, in many cases, with the payoffs being completed tasks. And so it's training computers to use these game theory concepts to solve things as effectively as possible. Traditional games, like game shows, gambling, board games, etc. These are clearly, many of these are clearly games, and they fit right in with these tools. They may not be quite as impactful to the world, but they still have good applications. And then biology. You can model natural relationships with biology. One example is the plover and the crocodile, which I will pull up on this chart. And so the plover, as the story goes, is a small bird that will jump into the mouth of a crocodile to clean its teeth. And this is a symbiotic relationship in nature. And so you can see the payoffs here that this is actually a Nash equilibrium. Because if the croc stops letting the plover clean its mouth by, for example, closing its mouth and the plover comes, it might eat the plover, as the plover will just be sad because it won't get that free meal. And the croc will have dirty teeth, which will have negative health benefits. And if the plover leaves, even though the croc wants it to clean, then the croc will have dirty teeth, and the plover will have to find a new meal. It won't get the easy pickings off the crocodile's teeth. So this is a Nash equilibrium, where neither party can get a better outcome by solely changing their own move, and this is another great application of game theory. Thank you.